Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maddie Hennessy. I'm with the Automotive Service and Tire Alliance. I'm here today with our monthly Lunch and Learn with ATI. Uh, Coach Jim Bennett is going to take it over today. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, my primary uh, role with ATI is the uh, Director of Technical Training and Development, and I work with a lot of technicians and shop owners that also still turn wrenches in the shop, as well as a certified coach as well. I'm a shop owner in and, and it used to be Virginia Beach, now Norfolk 17 Bay Auto Repair Shop. So I'm a current shop owner as well and been an ATI client since February of 2009. So a little bit about me. I'm an ASC world-class technician through the Auto Care Association. I'm a master credit automotive manager through AMI. I'm I did 22 years in the military and I was an instructor and a curriculum developer. Uh, just like North Carolina with state inspections, Virginia, I'm an unlimited uh, safety inspector for uh, Virginia. I'm on the Virginia Automotive Association Board of Directors, certified executive coach. The last four years for Mid-Atlantic, I was NAPA's ASC Technician of the Year through 2020. The Hampton Roads NAPA Business Development Group for the NAPA Auto Cares, previously a TechNet Advisory President. And I'm a Motors Assurance Program certified, and my shop is a participating MAP shop. Hopefully your shops are too. There's a lot of good things with their communication and standards. So I've uh, been the owner and founder of CarMaster since 1998. Uh, it was one of the first Napa gold shops in the country in 2019. Also ASC Blue Seal certified in a repair pell top shop. And if you, anybody needs any more information about any of that, uh, Maddie has my contact information. We can follow up afterwards. If you have any questions, please chat, please share. Um, if you're able to ask them verbally, whatever, I love knowledge transfer. So uh, we wanna make sure we address those. And I think, Maddie, you'll help with those, right? Roger that. So for years, both mechanical and collision, there's been a shortage. And the big, what's worse is many of the um, high schools are credited and evaluated by how many of their students go to college, not go through trade school and get a job. So that's made it a lot worse where many of the, the vote tax aren't funded like they used to. I've been on panels with Wrenchway and Find a Wrench with other individuals throughout that are working in a few of the left Votex throughout the country, as well as I sat on a three-month month panel from April to July with ASE Education and helped update the curriculum standards that are required for college, trade schools, and high schools to meet starting in 2022. Many of the other experts on the panel with me um, were from manufacturers as well as trade schools, colleges, and some uh, high schools. And they're telling, they're all seeing the consistent thing that across the board, there seems to be less and less support and less and less value. So with that being the case, that's, you know, leaving a shortage and, and about a third of the ranking of those are, are related to college, not skilled trades. So it, as well as a tech force, I don't know if anybody's familiar with tech force that has to do with technicians. If not, that's a very good thing. Recently, they had the, uh, their, their report about the shortage, which significantly increased. So um, that's, uh, you know, leaving no choice, especially with many of the dealerships have all of the technicians that are in some of the trade schools or college programs. They're sponsoring them, and they're going straight to those dealerships. Um, that's not a, a, a looking bright for us. So the only thing we have to do is we need to start um, building from within. Because especially within the next decade, there's going to be a lot of us that are got gray on the top like myself. We're going to be aging out, you know, and we can't turn wrenches forever. So we got to build from within. And what's the title of it, Are You Too Busy to Help Yourself? I've seen so many shop owners that are working harder than ever and in some cases making less money with the rising cost and the shortages. And they're literally too busy to try to come up with or use somebody else's apprentice program. Because, you know, uh, those are not in North Carolina, I know you raced. You raced down there because I raced at East Carolina Speedway in 2016 when Langley was closed. So, um, in Robersonville. So, uh, and I've had to learn that you have to sometimes slow down and go fast. When you're over aggressive and you just keep charging harder and harder and harder, um, it, it doesn't pay off sometimes in the long run. Same is absolutely true with 
in the shop and, and getting technicians. You're going to have to slow down to be a, and start training and assessing. The big part is assessing. Um, so many of, of us throughout our years of working in the industry, I'm sure we've got w one or more of those technicians we've worked with in the past or even currently that, you know, you hear them say, oh, never let them talk to a customer, right? You've, you've all seen that tech? Maybe we have one now. Well, often that's the same person that an apprentice, if you do try to get somebody new, is with that tech. And we kind of need to look at it in a different perspective that, you know, those technicians are, you know, your, your new people, your new apprentice, consider them internal customers. Whereas the customers that you're working on their vehicles, consider them external customers. They're all customers. You know, I'm sure you've had that technician that you probably spent some money with either a headhunter to find or ads or bonuses. And you've had a few that probably got hard, didn't work out. Sometimes they overpromise and under deliver. Um, the, uh, so knowing there's a shortage, it's, you, you really need to take better care of the ones you've got that are good, but you really need to start preparing the training from the ground up. The, uh, you know, why would you hire a skill? Uh, uh, why would you, why, if you have a master tech that's skilled, why would they require more testing and training? Because some people think, well, they're already at the top of their game, you know. Well, the, the problem is, you know, just like the golden rule is treating people as, as, uh, as you want to be treated, that's not so uh, applicable nowadays. And the same thing with that master technician. Typically, none of them have ever been trained in leadership, staffing and hiring, engagement, also known as soft skills, people skills. So and as well as we, they haven't been getting personnel profiles, personality assessments on them or the people you're hiring. Unless you're in a program like the ATI or equivalent that's doing that, and it's still kind of new for the technicians. That's why we're talking about this today. You know, giving you some tools and ideas, you know, to slow down a couple things to do different, that'll pay off in the long run. So we all know what a technician is. Um, I'm not going to go over that. The big difference is the mentor. We're, we're expecting, and for best results, a technician has to be a leader. They have to be a, a, a coach. They have to be a teacher or an instructor and a mentor. And there's a big difference between, um, you know, a mentor. You know, basically, a mentor is for long term. A mentor doesn't even have to be an expert in the field. You know, we've all probably heard of uh, Denny Hamlin. Well, one of his mentors, Michael Jordan, they formed a race team together. But Michael Jordan is one of the best basketball players of all time, if not the best. He knows how to be a professional. He knows what it takes for dedication. Just like you may have some, some people that, uh, that own a business, men or women, that may not know how to diagnose and fix cars, that may be the most squared away professional that can really help mentor some of the younger people in the shop if you do not have a technician, an A tech that's, or a B tech that's capable of doing that, where that A or B tech could be the, the leader, they could be the coach, the instructor. Now, once in a while, you're really blessed and you've got somebody like the rare unicorn where you've got a technician that can do all of that. And some shop owners are that way or some managers are that way. So that's part of still there's assessments for all of those to find out everybody's strengths and opportunities. So, and there again, the coach is kind of different yet than a mentor where a coach is specifically trying to get the most out of somebody, often what they already know to help develop and make them better. Just like world-class Olympians have coaches. They're not teaching them how to swim or how to run. They know that already. They're helping them to, to, to make them the best swimmer and the best runner, if that makes sense. So, and there again, coaching differs from mentoring because mentoring is big picture long-term and coaching is specific tasks and objectives. So, and combining those skills is, where, is when the dividends start paying off. When you train people and it's, uh, it's weeks and weeks of training for, with Automotive Training Institute for their technician mentoring workshop, their leadership, their engagement, their staffing and hiring, and even teaching service advisor skills so they can help their younger generation that they're hiring and bringing up know what a work order is supposed to look like, even though they're not going to be a service writer. They still need to know that. 
And even in the ASE NATAF accreditation standards for every trade school and college, they're supposed to know how to write a work order and know that and know what is correct and what's not. So that's not something new. Uh, and the important piece of the mentoring role and, and aspect of, of the program is leading by example. So you, you can't have a, a uh, your leader that you're developing the new individual if they're grumpy or unhappy or don't like something a service advisor has done and making that verbally known. You know, that can be kind of caustic on the on the morale and the environment. So they have to be that positive. They, that, that new person needs to look up to them, you know, because they're kind of making a, their legacy a mini-me, you know, so that you want to make sure that uh, that they are leading by example and that and that their modeling behavior is what you need for that apprentice to do. So the big thing is being tough minded and tender hearted because you got to push and challenge, but remain, remain encouraging. You know, some, sometimes the way that you respond, if, if you do it wrong and you're not showing opportunity and you're kind of beating them down, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people, especially uh, over 29% of the people are what they consider an A-type or an Eagle-type personnel. And, and, and they're the ones that they're already will beat themselves up typically, even if they're new and they're, they're you know, if they're that type person, they don't need a pile on of, of several people jumping on them when something goes wrong, especially when they're new at the job. So some of the characteristics and duties of a mentor, leading by example, job knowledge and experience, willing to share skills, knowledge, expertise, be committed to the growth, can articulate tasks and uh, possess the desired results, give advice based on experience, that's big. They, you know, when they're talking from experience, uh, must be attentive to the lesser uh, employee, you know, to their experienced employee. Treat individuals as partners, you know, not not as either on a throne or a pedestal, talking down to them. They need to encourage their growth, um, and identify performance. If it is being that, they got to talk about it. The big thing on a mentor is most of them have already arrived. Most of them are already at the top of their game, successful. So they don't really need to, you know, they're there for the benefit, the sole benefit of that apprentice to grow and learn. If that makes sense. So on top of that, we, we have all these different generations that are significantly different and in in, in what they want and how they need as kind of, you know, generalized here. And then within each general generation, there's different personalities. So you, you, you keep narrowing it down and that's back to where the old golden rule was, you know, treat others how you want to be treated. I've come to find out here in the last 10, 20 years, there's a lot of these people that don't like what I like. Can you believe that? Everybody doesn't like what I like. I can't imagine that. Why would that be the case? But it is. So sometimes doing, you know, treating them how I want to be, sometimes you can offend them without even knowing it. You know, and, so, and there's other people I've heard, you know, that, uh, you know, they, uh, they don't want to, you know, cater their talking. Well, no, that's not it. You know, in your own reception area where your customers are, you're going to paint the walls with colors that aren't going to give people a headache, right? You're going to put some fragrance in there like lavender, pumpkin size, something that the majority of people like. You're not going to pick like a Yankee candle or something with a fragrance burning building electrical. Who's going to want to hang out with that with their kids? So, you know, we really need to learn likes and dislikes. And, and what offends the majority of people and doesn't, and we want to try to do what's best because it's the right thing to do, if that makes sense. So personality profile, uh, you know, making good choices. A lot of the, for years, the, the automotive industry has gotten a lot better with sales training. Who here hasn't been contacted or seen an ad from, from some organization about how they can sell and make you better, make your shop better, right? multiple organizations out there not just ati there's many out there. there's new ones popping up every day they got trained by somebody yesterday now they're the expert and they're training someone else it happens um and i wish them luck because there's a, a need for it but with that being said we've been better in the last couple of decades of training our service advisors to be able to identify different buying personalities in other words if somebody wants the ultimate safety Somebody wants the ultimate high performance. Somebody wants the, you know, the best value, you know, like the tire. They don't want the cheapest. They want the one that's going to 
give them the most mileage for the most dollars, you know, ratio, you know, the best value. And there are some that do want the, the, the least expensive, right? The most economy. And just like we have some that are retail, some that are fleet. And we're pretty good at adjusting on that and knowing the difference, right? For the most part. We need to have the same thing with our people that are training and developing our technicians in the shop. That's part of the personality profiling where you learn the differences of the person in the shop and the difference of the people that you're training or hiring or screening. So you can either match the ones that are going to be more likely to get along and compatible, or there are some of the technicians are going to be like some of your good service advisors. When they know the difference in personalities and they're self-aware, they can adjust to, to, uh, to avoid conflict, if that makes sense, to make it for the best of the team. Same way that a service advisor is not going to, with somebody that wants the safest, isn't going to be, try to only sell high performance, right? Does that, if that makes sense. So, you know, that, that's the part of meshing and using the value of these assessments. So you can be self-aware and adjust and not offend and, 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 and get the most out of your team working together. So ATI, their basic entry level, they call a bird test with the, the dial, the owl, the peacock, and the eagle. And there again, the eagle is the one that I said that's equivalent to like a lot of your A-type people. They're, they have uh, um, probably 29% are known as eagles. And, and whereas a lot of your technicians are owls, a lot of your service advisors are peacocks, and a lot of your office admin and HR individuals are doves. But you, every organization needs all of those people. But some of them in different areas of work get along better than others and have conflicts. So it's kind of knowing the difference. To go to a next level higher than the bird test is the Wonderlick test, that a lot of sales and managers are used that at ATI, and then there's a newer one in the last few years, a PXD select test. That's a very advanced, where the Wonderlick is applied to the specific job positions, the Wonder, the PXD can be taken and applied to multiple job positions based on a, bat, a, a battery of answers and, and, and profiles. And that's a very in-depth uh, testing and, and personality profiling. I've taken all of those myself. So, the, the best thing is on the mentoring for recruiting strategies, you want to identify the right people. I don't know how many times, and I've, I'll be honest, I've made this mistake. I've, in 23 years of owning a business, I've had a lot of opportunity to make a mistake and learn from my mistakes. The, um, sometimes the way you coach, the way you deal, with, it's different in the last few years. I've learned that through some engagement and how the brain works and chemistry works. The other thing that a mistake that I had been making that I'm trying to share with, with everyone so they don't is too often we screen for a specific position first. If we're hiring a technician or a state inspector, a service advisor, a parts, tow truck, whatever, we only hire for that position and we focus on that. When we really should be looking at what's our culture? You know, if you, like Indeed, for example, the, if you search around in some of their admin and their tools, they have a whole section on definitions of a team player. And so does Wikipedia and others. I've kind of combined those and, and wrote and add, added to some of my own to that from experience to where now my, when I have ads out and someone responds, I want to see, are they a fit for my team? Are they a team player? Are they a fit for my culture? Because too often you can hire that technician or that service advisor. And, and if they're not a team player, they don't play nice with others and get along even though they may know the technical aspects and able to do the job, they know automotive or computers or cars. Sometimes they can make you turn your customers off and make your team less productive when you needed help, when you needed more power, man, manpower to, to, you know, to, as an asset to your team, they become a liability. Whereas if you screen for the first for their personality and, your, and their team player and all that, now they may have applied for a tech, but they may be a better fit for parts manager or service advisor or tow truck driver you know, or a different position. If you find somebody that's, that you screen kind of that way first, plus you need to set the expectations. So part of, in your job descriptions and your ads, you probably should include team player culture and other things. Because it's often when you don't and you find out after the fact, after you hire them, after they've been a while, 
and 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 the and the morale goes and the shop goes down because somebody's kind of a not so such a, a a team player as you'd hope. Sometimes that you know it slows you down and makes things worse when you needed to get better. So, um, and the big thing with diversity that actually can make your team stronger because when you have those different personalities and those different birds and you have them in the right position or they're self-aware where they get along and they don't and you avoid conflict and you and you utilize all the opportunities all the strengths and avoid the and avoid the, the the you know the the conflict that can really make an organization a little more well-rounded a little more better when you have strengths in all areas and you don't have any weaknesses it might need a combination of people you're not going to get that all out of one person but if that makes any sense so here we go others may not like to be treated the same that you like to be treated you know so much for that golden rule you know um i've learned in my 22 years i was in the military and, and i used to train we train the trainer first so often when we don't that technician mentor like that was one of the early questions we talked about the um, the uh, why would you a master technician that is very good at their job and very skilled need training. There again, how many of them have had all the soft skills and the personality profiling where they've had personality profiles done, then they learned how to assess the personality profile and then test other people applying. I've, I've been in some of the uh, technician and mentor workshop that I teach with ATI a couple day workshop that gets a mentor started in the program and i've had some shop owners and, and team leaders senior technicians like the aha moment when we did this together in class and then on lunchtime they went and tested everybody in their class on the second day of the workshop and they came back and they're like wow this tells us so much you know where we're, there's a couple people they needed to uh to uh shift a position or better understand or work with you know what it made the shop better you know, they say knowledge is power, right? So um, the uh, the big thing is the the training the senior person. Part of when I was in this in this uh, um, with working with all their uh, ASE NATAF panel th throughout the country for months, none of them that I'm aware of, and I also was at a in Chicago at the Moses Assurance program technical conference and i did a presentation there as well none of the other automotive industry that i'm aware of has a formalized accredited technician mentor workshop and program um, the ati one is accredited through ami for credits when you take the workshop um, and, and we've been sharing some of this with other professionals in the industry like we're doing today so whether they use our own ours or they create their own it's something you really need to consider and, and 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 implement one of the military things um when you for those that have been in the military especially the navy even even back in the 80s when you made e5 and above you went to what they called lmet leadership education management you went to training and they revised the name of it they still send no matter what your technical skill is whether you're a mechanic or a cook or your computers it didn't matter you went to when you became a, a petty officer and especially when you were a senior petty officer or chief petty officer, you went through leadership training. And how many of our shops now, are the technicians, have dedicated leadership training? Dedicated staffing and hiring so they know what's legal to do and what's, and what's not legal to do and what the best practices are to do? That, that's kind of important, especially the engagement training. For many, many years, and even the military, and there's some organizations still today, they teach the start out with something good when you try to counsel somebody, then go over the problem, then end on a positive note. Well, that, that's not how the brain works, and that's contrary to what we learn in engagement training on the brain chemistry. And now they like to refer to that as a, you know, using politically correct, a feces sandwich, you know, good, bad, good, you know. Uh, so that's not a good thing to have, right? Leaves a bad taste in your mouth, and so does somebody when you're counseling them. Um, so that's part of the staffing and hiring engagement, where you learn from the from how to pre screen, how to have your your technicians and your managers in your shop 
better work with your existing staff and new staff. And then when there is a problem, how to better adjust it, uh, excuse me, address it to where you're not being counterproductive. You're helping making the situation better instead of worse. Did we get any questions, anything coming in there, Maddie? Nothing? Very good. So, you know, testing both your senior technicians and a new process, you can, you can determine which will make a compatible team. Now, occasionally you may have some technicians, just like you may have had some people in sales, where one person may be an excellent fleet manager, not so good with retail customers, and vice versa. And whereas there's a few rare people that can adjust on the fly and handle anything, but you, you, depending on the workload you have, sometimes you need that dedicated fleet person, and so, and as well as you often need that depending, and some businesses only take care of fleets, so that's kind of important, and versus retail, because a lot of times they have different goals, different expectations. So that's where when you, when you do your testing and your matching, that you see who can adjust, who has the ability, who doesn't, and you match them up accordingly. And that may, if you do that correctly, that will often affect who you hire for what position. So we already, I kind of went over that a little bit when we talked about you know, that senior guy needing that training. So they can be that combination of the mentor, the coach, the leader, the instructor. Now, it's best to start this role with a senior technician can still perform. You know, you, want to, you don't want to wait to where they can't demonstrate anything because part of the modeling, part of how you do that is where they can, you, you screen them right, you get the compatible people, you do some basic theory in your regular, your OSHA regard safety training and everything else, and your senior tech can then demonstrate how to do some of this work. And they, they show them how to do it. And then next time they're doing it with a little bit of help, then next time they're doing it with no help and then they're good to go on their own. If, if you kind of don't slow down and you wait till that senior guy is not able to do much, they're not gonna be nearly as effective, if that makes sense. And ideally when, when the senior guy can train somebody and they get up to that C or B tech level, now the, the senior guy can do less heavy lifting and 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 the and the, the the guy they developed or woman they developed can now develop the next apprentice. A lot of people didn't know this that when you go to an, an accredited trade school or college, the um, the ASC NATEF actually has three levels. They've got what they call the MLR level, which requires a minimum of 540 hours for accreditation. They've got the AST, which is the Automotive Service Technician which is 840 hours. And they got the MAST, which is the Master Automotive Service Technician, a minimum of 1,200 hours. So some, some individuals go and join a school and they say, hey, I'm a credit, I passed. What level did you pass? And they're like, I don't know. So you really don't know what you paid for. Now keep in mind, a lot of people think, even if you want to have a certified, somebody that meets ASE's requirements, they have to, have to teach and mentor in your shop. For the MLR, the maintenance light repair, you only need the G1, A4, A5, A6. Four certifications and you can be a, an apprentice ASC certified instructor. So there's a lot of opportunity that we're missing out on, depending on teaching ourselves or working in it using existing apprentice programs. Um, you know, and the big thing is that when you do have somebody that you start your program and you kind of formalize it and, and, and they're recognized as a technician mentor, um, you got to recognize for the contribution. It's kind of like a promotion because they've never, and, and that's that same individual as they get a little older because they have those additional soft skills and managerial skills and people skills. They may be a good candidate to move up that eventually be your service manager or general manager or shop manager. You know, or if you're opening a new location, there's a lot of opportunities as you develop that individual, plus some of those senior techs that they, it, it, you may not know it, but if you haven't invested in them and you haven't trained them and they've peaked out as a master tech for years, a lot of people leave because of the fact there's no upward mobility 
or because they they they've maxed out and they're and, and they're or and they're working below their skill set. So that's another way to, you know, it's kind of like a promotion, you know, when when uh, and should be treated as such when you have somebody working in that capacity that you've trained to that level. So that's a good way to keep people as well by investing in them and it makes uh, them a better asset for your business. So, you know, and I also suggest that you kind of compensate the, uh, you know, the apprentice and the mentors on combined results. Often kind of expect the first couple months when they put the, the one, uh, a full-time apprentice with a, with a senior uh, team leader mentor that their probably productivity is going to drop a little bit because they're going to be focusing on the individual and getting them up to speed. After a couple months, the right team, they should be do, producing a little more. You probably don't want to have that team leader making less money when they're trying to help develop somebody new when they slow down a little bit so your organization can go faster in the future. You would hope they'd make the same or slightly more money, even if their results dropped a little bit, if they were doing a good job developing this new apprentice. Because like I said, eventually that can be where the apprentice is now the trainer and you keep multiplying. That's, that's the goal. So I've seen it on one to three months. I said two months, but usually if somebody's not as a team, the two aren't producing more in three months, probably need to reassess the apprentice and the mentor, you know, and see if there's a disconnect or if maybe the apprentice isn't the right fit. Or I've seen sometimes some mentors were, they, they couldn't, even with some training, they were still that guy in the shop. You didn't want to talk to a customer internal or external, you know, where they weren't getting the most out of their, uh, out of their apprentice. The, uh, um, and I, I don't see any questions or anything yet, or we're good to go. I don't see any in the chat. Okay. So talked about it like a promotion and celebrated. And that's something that you're usually going to do if there's a, a promotion or something positive in front of everybody, you know, that somebody, and, and you, often I suggest you, they say train the trainer first. So before you hire that apprentice, you identify who's going to be your mentor. You start their personality profile testing. You start training them on people and soft skills. That way they're, uh, they're they are ready for, and they can help screen and help hire um, and place apprentice applying. And I really suggest you start getting your apprentice right out of high school. And there have been some great men and women that could do, um, that are working in automotive shops and other uh, shops throughout the country that came right out of high school. And uh, they didn't have any bad habits. How many people have you ever, like we talked about in the beginning, how many hired a technician or a service writer didn't work out? There are sometimes it's because they may know automotive and they passed the screening and you hired them, but they they didn't relate to customers well, or they or they had too many errors or comebacks, or they were caustic and they weren't team players. So when you've got that team player and you have that working right, you really want to celebrate and reward that. So automotive training institute, if for those uh, if any of the shops are part of ATI or looking at ATI. They do have su suggested pay plans for the mentor and the technician as well. There's a couple of different options depending on the state you're in. So your compliance with state laws and regulations. Um, as well as we talked about, there's a, quite a bit of different training that uh, similar to what a lot of shop owners or managers get that's now at the technician level. So. Um, most of the shops are short-handed. Shop owners and senior technicians are too busy. I don't know if there's any shops out there that aren't. If they are, that's pretty rare nowadays. There's a, a national manpower, you know, skilled label shortage. There's more and more cars backed up where you can't get them in the door. Um, so this is a chance for your senior technician to create a legacy, and especially the shops where the shop owner has been the senior technician or the diagnostic technician. You're probably a little behind. You know, I, ideally you get your shop up and working where they can work without you and you're an asset to help every area as needed and you're working on the shop and not in the shop. That's hopefully something that you're striving for. You know, and what's, what's really, when, when, the, when the B technician 
and your senior technician can't you know can do it when your senior technician can't do the heavy stuff and his b tech that he trained under him you know under his supervision he can do it that's what we talk about modeling modeling you know you you and you really only need the b tech training a junior apprentice and the a tech to train the b tech but you might have to start if you don't have, if you're shorthanded, you might have to start with the A train and the apprentice until you get everybody up to speed. And even if you have the A doing that, you can still have the B tech and other techs assist on some task. So hopefully you, you, you create a revolving model where everybody works together as a team. They know um, the, the job of the apprentice when they come in, that the new guy is to, or woman is to learn. That's their whole job is to learn, not clean up, because that'll turn them off. So in, in, the other thing is, as hard as it is to find technicians, it's harder than ever to keep them, you know, especially some of the good ones. And part of that, you know, like I said earlier, that the, there's many reasons why they leave, and they often say that employees don't leave companies, they leave managers. But often, if they're not, if you're not investing in them, and there's no growth for them, there's no upward promotion, no growth, which is which often happens when you get into the senior a, B and A techs in a shop, and there's uh, and they're not being challenged. You know, they're they're working, uh, um, doing uh, you know C and D tech level stuff, and they're a senior A tech. You know, that's one of the old sayings that we've all heard. That's why toolboxes have wheels, right? You know, and that's why even some dealerships, because of that, they're starting to they're furnish all the toolboxes built in and all the specialty tools in their inventory. And a lot of technicians don't have room at home to keep their big toolbox and they wind up selling the stuff. It makes it a little harder for them to kind of get their claws into somebody and keep them. It's also easier for somebody new not to have a big investment. So that's good for the tech sometimes, but it's better for the shop sometimes. The the best thing is, you know, is to avoid that altogether. Is you know, to attract an existing good team is have the right culture. Don't just say you care, show you care. You know, when when you have the right culture and you're taking care of them properly, they're going to take care of you, especially when you're continually investing in them and training them. You know, one one of my sayings that I love, and it's even in my emails. And I and this is many years ago, and I've heard some professional speakers use this too. But I, like probably over ten years ago, I had uh, one of the uh, part stores that I wasn't wasn't my primary part store was affiliated with, because I always had that train. Whether it was a CTI, I always had CarQuest, or if I was NAP, I always had the Auto Care. But then I would buy all the training from another part store, in addition to our in-house training. And I and I had one of the salesmen say, "Well, I know you're going to buy it, but I don't understand what why." You spend so much on training, training your people. What if they leave and you spend all that money training them? And I thought about it and I'm like, and what if I don't and I keep them? <laughs> you know, then what do I have? So the, the big thing is invest in them by training better than anyone or anywhere else ever has. Learner likes, learner dislikes, goals both personal and professional. You know, there again, you got to slow down a little bit. You can't just keep next, next, next a car. You, if you care about your people, you got to show them. There's been some times when some of the, the people that I've hired had some goals for a home or this or that. And a lot of us, I'm sure, like myself, we've networked. We've been in the community for decades. We know other people. Sometimes it might not even cost you anything but the time to find out one of your your team members, one of your some of your staff, what some of their personal goals are. And you might just, it might be a phone call to a friend and say, hey, I've got somebody interested in this. I know you do it. And it doesn't cost you anything but a few minutes. Or sometimes even if you surprise them and if there's something they want to learn to play guitar or whatever, and you know somebody that's a professional and you pay for a couple bucks and say, hey, will you give them some lessons? Sometimes it goes a long way. I've had some people that wanted to do something in a race car. I have known a couple. You know, so that was easy to put them in a race car for, you know. So there's all there's all different things you can do that you don't know until you ask. And, and by asking, you care. Just like one one of the things that uh, 
part of having your team meetings is a lot of people say, I don't want conflict. Well, in a team meeting for a manager, if you've got an idea, you're putting something out, especially change, conflict can be very positive. There's a book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Family. It's a pretty good book to read that they talk about the conflict by if, if somebody thinks there's going to be a problem with something, they need to be heard. And sometimes if that's legitimate, that will affect how the team's going to do what they're planning on doing. So you avoid it. There may be some things that they're not aware of at a higher level that the, a manager or shop owner may be aware of that that might have been a concern to them. But there was greater concerns if they didn't go the way they were going, but at least them being heard, they're more likely to buy in with the results knowing they were being heard, even if it didn't go their way. Decades ago in the 20s or 30s, GM leader called all his executives together and had all kinds of, you know, audacious new ideas and things they want to implement. And he put them out in a meeting and everybody there was like nodding their head. Yes, 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 yes. And he got upset, you know, because they had days where the meeting schedule. And he said, you know what? Your work meeting again with the meeting's over. You go back to work. You got two weeks. You need to find out reasons why what I just said won't work. If you don't, you're fired. You know, because I, I, I don't want problems and I want to know every possible hurdle, obstacle, or unforeseen thing that could cause this not to work. So we're ahead of it. You know, or if there's some things we, that, are, that weren't, for, weren't expected, that maybe we avoid it. Don't do it altogether. I want to know. That's your job. Is let me know conflict. Let's let's rise above it. Let's address it. So, you know, I'm not telling you to threaten all your people if they don't come up and tell you why something doesn't work, but to give you real life examples of how that's worked in the industry. So you need to know what they like and what they don't like. That's the point I'm trying to make. You know, I used to have meetings and say, you know, I want to know three things that you like that you never, that we do, you never want to see change. Three special things that you weren't used to seeing at, at a different shop you worked at. And then I would like to know three things and I don't, sky's the limit, whatever, you know, that you think you'd like to see different. And I can remember uh, back in the uh, early uh, uh, 2010, 2012, some people were saying, you know, it'd be nice. We, we, we had where we were at, we had a, uh, um, 15 bays, but they weren't that big of bays and we didn't have any secure fenced in parking. We had some parking and they were like, you know, it'd be nice to have a little bigger shop. It'd be nice to have a, a little bigger parts area. It'd be nice to have uh, some bigger bays. You know, more would be nice, but bigger bays would be nice. And I'm thinking, well, we're, that's probably not going to happen until the, where I was at, it was in a shopping center and they, uh, they were redeveloping. And then I wound up finding a dealership that had gone uh, a former uh, uh, Jeep Renault dealership with 17 large bays and large fenced in parking. It's pretty hard to find in any area, you know, especially in a large city, heavy traffic area, a location that big. And so I never thought I would have going to be moving until the opportunity presented itself. You know, so that's the kind of thing that, you know, it, you know, even though you might not think it may never happen, let it be heard. Then I started thinking about it. You know what? It happened. Before that, I would have been, nah, I wouldn't even considered it. And we heard a couple times, hey, you, maybe you need to think about it. So, and then follow up routinely on, on their goals. You know, just like you would their performance. So have that notebook, have that personnel file, you know, have their professional goals. A lot of times if you're going to, it, 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 you, you're you going to hire somebody. That's part of the other thing is we talked about the existing people keeping them, but even getting the hire new people, often they want to, you need to tell them, hey, this is where, you know, some people just ask, well, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, why don't you have a plan based on where they're at now, where they're going to be in two years and five years, where you expect them, where you're going to help grow them to, where you're going to guide them to, you know, this is what our organization does. You know, we, we're, we're not about stagnant and as is and, 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 you know, and status quo. We want to continuously improve and invest in you. It, it, I don't, you know, I can't see your talk. I ask how many are doing that now, but often I find a lot are not doing that. You know, so that, that just, uh, that just something to consider. 
you know, it's just part, a part of attracting, keeping, and, and gaining. So there again, the platinum rule, the new rule says we should do unto others the way they want us to do unto them. You know, in other words, treat people the way they want to be treated. Not the golden rule, not the way I like to be treated. Because I would doubt if, Maddie, I doubt if you and I like all the same things, right? It could be true, but I would be surprised. I've kind of been starting to learn that lately, you know? So, um, the, uh, you know, if you're short-staffed and you're too busy to change, you know, keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Uh, there's a definition for that, right? Keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. And some people call that insanity. <laughs> So it, it, you can't be too busy and just think, expect things to change on their own. You got to be the change. You got to be pro proactive. And you know why do you why do you spend so much training your team? You know what if they leave? <laughs> what if I don't and they stay? So I I don't know how else to sum it up better than that. I've lived by that. So that's not just a, you know, and all all my staff I've learned years ago. Um, if they're going to all day service advisor training, even if they're going to a three hour technician class, they're getting compensated for that while they go to the training. In addition to me buying the training, there's a, if anybody's having some, uh, um, so, you know, any issues at all with morale or staffing. And even if you're not a very inexpensive book to read, I actually paid my staff a hundred bucks to read it. They had, there's 10 questions in each chapter and they had to fill out the answers if they wanted the hundred bucks. It's about a three hour, three and a half hour read. It's called Lessons from the Mouse. Dennis Snow wrote it. He was worked at Disney for years. And it talks about internal and external customers and how you treat people and how you act. And it's usually a pretty good investment. It will help improve the morale on just about any team out there. The, the other um, good read kind of related to this today is the um, John Maxwell's uh, Mentoring 101. I highly recommend it. It's another, you see my hand, it's not a, you know, there again, I'm 6'2", big guy, but it's not a very big book. Just like the Lessons from the Mouse, it won't take you forever because some people aren't book readers or they're too busy. The Five Dysfunctions of the Team is a little bigger book, you know what I mean? Start out with the easy ones. Let everybody in the team read lessons from the mouse. It's even available on audio if, you, if the owner's too busy or manager's too busy. You want to do it at the same time. But the uh, the uh, I really encourage those. Start with those two easy books: the, the Mentoring 101 and the uh, Lessons from the Mouse. I left about 10 minutes. If there was going to be any questions, we're closing into the end now. Um, and we do I, we do classes and presentations on diagnostics and all kinds of training, you name it. So I don't know if you got any other questions, or is there any you got anything from the chat or anybody else, or are we? They can watch it later, and if they have questions, they've got my email right there on the screen. Well, thank you, Jim. I think you did a perfect job summing it up. So much so that we don't have a single question right now. Wow. Okay. Very good. And uh, like I said, I look forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And there's a lot of shop owners that I know. I, don't, I hope they're all in your organization. If not, I'll have to uh, have to reach out to them. Uh, the uh, Dean and Jeff Shiflett down in North Carolina. There's a bunch of others that I know. I don't know if they've joined up with you, but they should. Um, they both own shops. And, and I know several others down there as well. Well, thank you, Jim. We appreciate it. And hope, hope that you have such a great uh, new year and holiday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.